So in this video, we're going to talk about the chain rule and the conformal mapping theorem. The chain rule is really a rule that could have been included in the previous video. It basically says uh, that uh, if you take the derivative of a composition of two functions, uh, if it's a complex derivative, the chain rule still works the way that you expect. It's going to be f prime of g times g prime. Okay, so that's the chain rule in a nutshell. The proof is uh, almost identical to the proof of, in a Calc 1 book, so I'll let you uh, look that up. So that's the chain rule and the conformal mapping theorem. So conformal mapping is this idea uh, that we talked about when we were talking about the functions like f of z is z squared, f of z is square root of z. So the conformal mapping theorem tells you, it, it kind of tells you when exactly um, does a function uh, preserve angles. So, uh, so we'll explain. So the conformal mapping theorem says the following. So suppose that you have a function f and suppose that f is a holomorphic at a point a. So suppose f is holomorphic uh, at a point a in the complex plane. Remember holomorphic means that not only is it differentiable in a, but it's differentiable in a small open disk um, centered at A. So not only is it differentiable at that one point, it's differentiable in a little neighborhood at that point. So suppose F is holomorphic at A and F prime of A is non-zero. It turns out that those are the only criteria that you need in order to guarantee that F will be conformal at A. Uh, and what that means is that uh, then uh, given two smooth paths, so given two smooth uh, paths uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2 that intersect at A. Uh, making in their intersection makes uh, an angle uh, say theta. So, so the picture that I want you to have is that you have some point A it's in the complex plane. You have two curves. I don't really care what curves they are. They just have to be smooth. So that means that they're differentiable and non-zero. Um, and so you have uh, two curves, um, and so they're going to intersect at some point A, so something like that. I don't know why I made it so complicated. Whatever. And they're going to intersect at some angle theta, okay? So their, their angle of intersection we're going to call theta. Then it turns out that if F has this property that it's holomorphic at this point, and if the derivative of F at A is non-zero, then when you look at the composition of f composed with gamma one and f composed with gamma two, those are gonna also intersect. Those are gonna intersect this time at f of a uh, in the paths. Um, so those two paths are gonna intersect at f of a and they're also gonna make the same angle theta, making angle theta. Okay, and so uh, this is the picture to think about. So this is our input. Okay, so here's A. And then once you apply the function, what's gonna happen is you're gonna think about uh, what are uh, the areas of, of uh, what's the angle of intersection? When I say angle of intersection, just to be perfectly clear about what I mean, what I mean is draw, and I'm gonna pick a different color here, but draw tangent vectors at this point. Okay, so we have if this bottom one is gamma one, then this red vector here is gonna be gamma one prime at A. That's just the, the tangent vector of that curve gamma one at A. And likewise, gamma two, if this curve up here is gamma two, then this purple line, this purple line here is gonna be uh, gamma two prime at A. And so now you can think about what's the angle that those two vectors make with each other. That's a completely well-defined angle, uh, which we're going to call theta. My picture's uh, not the best, but the idea is that that angle uh, is really just the angle of intersection of the two uh, tangent vectors to the curves at that point. Okay. And so what we're going to do, and we're going to actually go ahead and prove this in general, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute what's the angle of intersection of the two curves F composed with gamma one and F composed with gamma two. Of course, they're gonna intersect at F of A, but what's the angle of intersection there? Okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about. 
So uh, first of all, if gamma one and gamma two intersect, that means that they're equal at some time, let's call it T naught. I think the book calls it zero. It really doesn't matter what time it is, um, whether it's T equals zero or T equals T naught, whatever. So first notice that gamma one of T naught and gamma two of T naught are both equal to A uh, for some value T naught. Okay. And like I said, gamma one, I'm gonna write this, but notice that gamma one prime of A and gamma two prime of A are just the tangent vectors. So these are the tangent vectors of gamma one and gamma two respectively at A. Okay, so those are just the two tangent vectors at A. Fine, so really nothing uh, there yet. Um, but now let's consider so let's consider the derivative of F composed with gamma, we, we're gonna do this with both of them, but F composed with gamma one, um, that's just gonna be, so this is the derivative of F of gamma one of T, it's gonna be F prime of gamma one times gamma one prime of T, just based on what we said before. And likewise, the derivative of F composed with gamma two is f prime of gamma two of t times gamma two prime of t. And in particular, what this means is that if you're to think about what's the derivative of f composed with gamma one at t equals t naught, well, what's gonna happen is you're gonna take your t equals t naught and plug it in here and here. We're gonna plug it into uh, the function. So this is f prime of gamma one of T naught times gamma one prime of T. And that's nothing more than F prime of A times gamma one prime of T. Um, and likewise, so again, doing the exact same thing, but now for gamma two, we get that the derivative of F composed with gamma two evaluated at T equals T naught is equal to F prime of A times gamma two prime of T, because what you're doing is you're taking again, the same idea, plug in T naught, gamma two, uh, gamma two of T naught is just uh, uh, A, so that's F prime of A. And then I want you to just notice what's happening here. Um, the derivative of F of gamma one at this point T naught, this derivative is F prime of A times what we had before. And uh, I'm sorry, what I had before is not quite exactly right. It should be a T naught, not a T. So uh, this is F prime of A times gamma one prime of T naught. And likewise, the other one, uh, this one is F prime of A times gamma two prime of T naught. So that's the derivative of the other curve. And this is enough to tell you that it's conformal because think about what's happening here. Here, gamma one prime of T naught and gamma two prime of T naught are the two, um, tangent vectors to the original point A at that point T naught. So those are the original vectors. And if you multiply by F prime of A and F prime of A, those are just the same multiple of the two vectors. So multiplying by F prime of A actually dilates the vectors. So it can either um, uh, shrink the vectors or stretch the vectors by dilate the vectors by a certain amount, but that doesn't change the angle. Um, and then if also if we multiply by F prime of A, we're dilating by the modulus and then uh, possibly rotating by the argument. So really all I'm saying here is we know already that if we multiply two complex numbers together, we, we've talked about what that means to the, uh, you multiply the moduli together and you add the angles. And so here multiplying by F prime of A means that we're just rotating that curve, that picture uh, by some fixed angle. The angle that we're rotating by is the argument of F prime of A, whatever that happens to be, but we're rotating it by the same angle for both curves. So that, that means that that angle theta gets preserved under this transformation F, okay? And so this is enough to say that uh, F composed with gamma one and 
uh, f composed with gamma two also intersect. Of course, they also intersect at f of a. And their intersection makes angle theta. Okay, so making angle theta. So in summary, uh, it turns out that a function f is going to be conformal at all points where it has a derivative and where that derivative is non-zero. So I need to slightly correct what I said before, because what I said before in, in some of the videos was a slight oversimplification. So just as an example, uh, and then I'll let you fill in the, the rest of the details. I, I think I said that the function f of z equals z squared is conformal, and that's true everywhere but the origin. <laughs> It's not true with the origin. So f of z equals z squared. Um, notice that we, we know that the derivative of f of z is going to be 2z. So uh, f of z equals z squared is conformal for all values z except, uh, except the, the complex number 0. Okay, So it's conformal at all non-zero complex numbers because the derivative is zero at exactly z equals zero. Okay, but everywhere else it's conformal. So that's where you got that picture. Um, and let's pull that picture up again. Let's see if we can find it. Okay, I think it's this one. It's not that one. It's gotta be one of these. Maybe it was that one. So uh, it's this picture where uh, again, if you zoom in, um, if you zoom in, you're thinking about what are the paths. So pick any point that you want. I'm going to draw on this now. So pick any point that you want. Think about what are two curves that intersect that point. Say they could meet at a 90 degree angle. And then it turns out that if you look at the output, what's going to happen is if this is A, then F of A is probably uh, somewhere over here. And if you think about these two curves, think about the tangent lines to those curves, you're going to get something like that and something like that. And the, the um, f of gamma 1 and f of gamma 2 also intersect at that angle uh, theta. So theta in this case being 90 degrees. Okay, so these are going to be conformal everywhere except the origin. And then notice what happens at the origin. So this is also interesting. If you were to take a value, and in fact, the origin's not quite on this picture. But if you were to take a value really close to the origin, what ends up happening is that it gets really warped, really, really warped. So uh, it's still going to be conformal because if you were to take, um, so let's uh, look at a, a point here. But if you were to take something like uh, zero, maybe like, uh, I don't know, one tenth i or one hundredth i or something like that, when you, when you, uh, multiply it, it's gonna, gonna stay over here. And so these curves get, it's kind of hard to see, but if you, if you were to look at these curves, they still meet at 90 degrees. So if you were to zoom in here, you would still see that this yellow curve and this blue curve still meet at 90 degrees. And I'm looking at uh, this yellow piece and this blue piece, but they still come together at 90 degrees. Okay, so it is conformal everywhere except the origin. And of course at the origin, everything gets kind of bent uh, and here, the angles don't get preserved at the origin. Okay, so there's a, an example of when a function is conformal. Uh, and then we have our conformal mapping theorem, which gives us conditions on which a, a function is going to be conformal.